just as a lead in, you know, here's the church. That's the church in the interior. St. Mary's Church. That's the school. You want the interior of the church, don't you? Before we get to the school, that's that famous cross. This was there when I was a kid, 10, 10 12 years old. Still, so, I'm sitting next to you. Right. Okay, now this is the school that you attended. Yes, St. Mary's School. It was right across the street it's from the right church? right across from the church. And this is a photo that's contained in the 50th anniversary Correct. book. St. Mary's Roman Catholic Church, Rosebank, Staten Island, the ties that bind 1852 to 2002. Beautiful looking school. Yes. It has a Practically unchanged, right, from yeah. when I attended there. Uh, this is the interior of St. Mary's School. In fact, it's in the, in the rear of the auditorium of the school. And these are photographs of, of graduates that go back quite a way. We're looking at the home of Rocky Marciano, his birthplace. Uh, it's been refurbished, and the street is called Marciano Way. Do you know how long he lived in this home? I don't, Frank. However, uh, there was also a stadium named after him, the Marciano Stadium, and other landmarks, particularly the Brockton Historical Society, where the the Rocky stamp, the commemorative stamp, was later unveiled. Right. Uh, the very first coaching assignment was at the A.B. Davis High School in Mount Vernon, where we were not permitted to teach anything but bag punching. Subsequently, wanting to continue and to get boys in bouts and training amateur boxers, I then went to the Tuckahoe Police Athletic League. That's right here. Interesting story there is that the the <laughs> founder of the Police Athletic League was Milton Gibbons. He was a sergeant in the Tuckahoe Police Department. He later became 10-term mayor of Tuckahoe. Wonderful man. Hmm. Okay. And then? Well, then I really took off an earnest managing professional on amateur fighters. Right here is the picture of the Turnbine and some of the amateurs that train there. Right here is a professional, Leo La Salva, who was born in Pelham, and he became a This is the fellow right yeah, here? right here. He later became contender for the Walter White Championship, ranked third and fourth right. at one time. These are amateurs. Okay. This was at the Turnvine? Yes, the Mount Vernon Turnvine. At North 10th Avenue. Okay. And they were very uh, cooperative with us. And it was a physical fitness place mostly, but they gave us the stage right. in which we erected a ring. And that was the most successful venture uh, at that time. Okay. All right. And then? And then uh, we went from there to the. Uh, uh, to the uh, I'm going to turn right then to the White Plains YMCA. I, my my venue changed because the YMCA would only allowed you to instruct ten to twelve year old youth. But I had the good fortune at the YMCA to meet uh, Herb Proton, the forty one year coach at West Point. And he came down to help me launch the program. And there's some photos here of Herb and I instructing the youth who followed whatever we showed them to do, what to do. There's still another location, the Mount Vernon YMCA. Was there for a short while, before going to the before I went to the Mount Vernon YMCA. Here's a, here's a shot right here. This is her department of being a Golden Globe champion and coached at the point for 41 years. And this is you right here, yes. right? And Herb was on the other side. Yeah. 
There's far better photos than that, which uh, right. I can show. Is this about the same time where I see you doing an no, exercise? No, this is much here? earlier. Here oh, I am. I see. Still in this gym in New York. Oh, actually. I see. Okay. That's later. And, and what is this photo here? This is a wonderful fellow I developed who won 27 in a row, Irish Bill Mulvey. He lived in Mount Vernon. Hmm. And he's a wonderful kid. He started 16, went on to win, as I said, uh, 18 matches in a row. This is the, well, this is a little, little before, after that, I went to the, uh, started to coach boxing at colleges. This was the very first one. This is the Concordia College in Bronxville. Okay. Group 22. And some of the students. Hmm. I was there for two years. So at Concordia College in Bronxville. Yeah. On Route 22. Correct. You coached for about two years? Yeah. A little more than two years. And then after that, you moved to? Sarah Lawrence. Sarah Lawrence. Yeah. And Sarah Lawrence is also a... Also in Bronxville. Okay. That's a very exclusive school, as you may know. Mostly women, though, right? Well, at the time, a while back, there were most women, but I think it's quite integrated with males now. Right. But when you were coaching, you were coaching well, men I had, or I had, women? I had a female, but they're mostly men. Okay. Steve, this is a badge called Institute for Physical Fitness. And you just told me that Bonnie Pruden. Yeah, Bonnie Pruden is the person who, who re rehabilitated an old elementary school in White Plains, where she had six gyms, outdoor equipment as well. She was a member of President Eisenhower's uh, Committee on Physical Fitness. And uh, Bonnie was a really professional uh, Developer or well, she was a fitness person? Of physical fitness. Oh. And so when I approached her about teaching boxing, she accepted it. Huh? We were there for six years and she helped me close the school. Is that right? And, and she, uh, we then did a program. Her daughter got into it as well. Huh. So we did a show on NBC showing the boxing. Oh, is that right? Yeah. So I admired Bonnie greatly. I don't know if she's still alive. She moved to Stockbridge, Mass. But uh, that was a story that she opened the school. Right on Hillside Avenue in White Plains. In White Plains, yeah, correct. Yeah. Well, I helped you, but I was helped myself. I right. went to see a professional boxing bout, unbeknownst to my mother, on one of the piers of stable in Staten Island. And I had read Gene Tunney's book a number of times, and it epitomized the art science of boxing. And therefore, I uh, went to this fight, as I said, I'm being out to my mother. And I was thrilled with this skillful expedition that was exhibited by one Mary Mario from Duncan Hills of Staten Island. Right. He was fighting a brawler from South Beach. Right. Was, uh, they had fought a couple of times, so it was established some kind of local feud. So Mario won the fight. And later, later on, I was walking down Main, uh, Bay Street, which is the main street on Staten Island. And right across from the church, which we looked at before, there was this Christmas tree shop with wide doors, which were wide open. And uh, hmm. I realized that the proprietor of the Christmas tree salesman was none other than Mighty Mary, the fellow I'd seen fight. Is that right? Yeah. I was like beckoning, beckoning you inside with the wide open, so. wide open door. And therefore, I walked over and I congratulated him on his victory, which I had seen. And uh, he asked me if I liked boxing. I said, I did. So he said, look, look, kid. He said, do you go to school? How many days do we go to school? I said, five. <laughs> and then he said, well, would you like to help me on Saturday for bowling, you know, and in exchange for the lessons? I seized the opportunity, and he would, when there was a lull in the shop, he would raise his right hand, open the palm open, right. and have me strike at that with a left jab. Oh. And, and combination blows. Right. When I was defensively inaccurate, he would tap me to show me that I was open. Right, right, right. Blow. And then 
Can I get to the end of this Christmas? Well, Christmas was over some of the lessons. I went to the New York City Pier, the Catholic Youth Organization, and had the good fortune to meet Jack Britton. You know, I had over 325 fights. It's Mike, well, he's considered a master boxer, and he's the one that helped me perfect my left hand, Jack Britton. He had fought Benny Leonard several times, and, he, and then became hooked on Benny Leonard based on what he had told me. Yeah. And Benny Leonard was my weight. So uh, Benny Leonard became my idol. And then I moved from the Catholic Youth Organization to Stillman's Gym. As a, as a 16 and a half, 17 year old. It was a tremendous. And where was Gene? Well, Gene Tony, Tony was. Gene Tony was retired. I see. And he was quite before my time. Right. He was trying to retire living on the lap of luxury in St. Connecticut because he had the good fortune not only to have retired with two million dollars, which is quite a lot of money at that time. Gee. 1932 or whatever. Wow, it's like worth 20 million or more. He had a good fortune to marry Polly Laura, Andrew Carnegie's ace. And when they met and fell in love, the other thing was that Jean would retire. And she, he and uh, Polly were married in the Vatican. And he was happy ever after. He died at 89 years of age. He was my first idol. Hmm. And this photo triggered that memory for you? Yes, it did. Okay, Steve, uh, related to coaching, mm -hmm. not necessarily coaching here, but... A clinic. A clinic. Tell me about this photo. Well, this was it's taken... It's like a lot, of, a lot of people here. These are guys. police department written recruit records. Police department uh, rookies. Okay. And there were about 200 in the room. And we went down there and showed them a film and divided the group of 200, 200 into groups of 50. And we taught each group the same thing that was being demonstrated from the, from the dais there. Not the dais, but there was a little part. Now, were they going to use these skills well, in uh, the extent, law enforcement? Yes. Hmm but mostly defensive skills because right. it's not a, a situation where a police officer can fence with something too long. Right. So they were shown how to throw straight rights, right. and how to get off fast so that they'd have a chance. Now, how does boxing compare with other, for instance, martial arts as far as defensive well, um, martial, moves boxing, like karate or jiu-jitsu? Boxing is a martial art. Okay. However, any of these sports cannot be utilized properly if the people that do utilize them are not adept. You have to have a tremendous amount of skill. You can go to a place and learn karate or, right. or any one of those type of uh, martial arts, but utilize them, using them, having the expertise and the speed and the, and the presence of mind to use that when someone has a gun hmm. or is endeavoring to... Use a knife is another story. Right. So we, we, when I was in the crime prevention department, I advised people to drop a pocket, throw it one direction, run the other, rather than get hurt. Right. See, you have people that are not only endeavoring to hold you up, but they become frightened. They've been assistant coach for a long time at the White Plains Y and many other places where I coached. And he, he would uh, work in the corners with the amateur boxes in New York or wherever we went. His name was Kid Sharky Sposato, a West Boxer draw versus Ray Robinson. He was a good coach, and he's also a Purple Heart veteran. Kid Sharky Sposato. Yeah, that was his name. Okay. These are some other boxes well, here. Well, some other champions I met in the past at the Hall of Fame. That's uh, Severino Garcia. And this story is an interesting one. He was famous for the bolo punch. That's a sweeping the uppercut. Bolo? Yeah, sweeping uppercut motion. I see. And he developed that punch because he was born in the Philippines. As a youth, he used to cut sugar cane. And cutting sugar cane would require a bolo knife. I well, see. Sweep you up with that motion. Didn't Dempsey have a no. uh, uppercut like that too? No, no. No. 
This was perfected by Sephirino Garcia. Ah. It was later utilized by Kid Gavilan and a couple of other people. But he hit hard with it. And as I said, it's a sweeping up cut motion, which ah. develops that, <laughs> that swing. And he got that from cutting down sugar cane. Yes, he did. Ah. He was a pretty good player. Okay. And this is another fighter. He was from, from Hawaii. His name was Bobo Olson. He was the middleweight champ of the world. Very nice fellow. I met him in California at the Hall of Fame. Steve, concurrent with your profession of helping boxers, coaching, running the AAIB, etc., you also were very much involved in crime prevention. Law enforcement, yes. Can you tell us about yeah, that? Yeah, well, I was in the sheriff's office for a long time, and it became chief court officer, which is, which I it was a good job. But it was the most unappealing thing I ever did because it's not my forte as a person who taught uh, boxing, boxed the professional, and coached youth, hundreds of youth over the years. And it was always a pleasure to see them achieve, gain confidence to face life in their respective fields of endeavor. However, a wonderful man named Thomas J. Delaney was elected sheriff. And he was a progressive sheriff who went to California and found out that most of the counties, most of the states have crime prevention and youth activities unit. Give me the idea of the time frame. This is in the mid-70s? Well, let me tell you in 1986. I'm trying to find a I can obtain, obtain the date without disturbing. Right. And if you were there for about 14 years or so? No, or? I was appointed in 1956 and until 1984 I was in the sheriff's office. Okay. In one capacity or another. All right. But the most fruitful part of my career was that the, when Tom Delaney was elected sheriff, right. I then became the first youth activities and crime prevention director mm. in the department's history. And I was there, to, I held that job until 1986, at which time I retired, as did my wife from the Board of Education. Now, you were able to promote the activities of that organization because you were so well networked with all the youth groups and, well, yeah, and thing, uh, institutions that supported the group. Yeah. So. We did such things, frankly, with youth. We had bicycle inspections, art shows, poster programs. Again, of things for youth. And one of the things we did was to take them to different jails. We went to Fishkill Reception Center, mm. Sing Sing, Rollway. And we took the youth there in buses, of course, the sheriff's vehicles, and had them talk with and had them experience being in a six by nine foot cell. Mm. So that the reality of getting locked up committing a crime was very prevalent to them. Right. Uh, I think it was very effective that talking to these prisoners who, who use very profane language, they, right. they, they call it scared straight. It was a very successful program. So that youth preliminary getting into any problems with the law exactly. would experience what would happen. I'm sure. The they were fingerprinted and all these things. They were too tall that their fingerprint there's a record established. What an excellent idea, and I'm sure the word spread quickly among the youth, it too. Is, it is. For instance, they would say, oh, guess where I was yesterday? I was at a prison, and all of a sudden the stories would would uh, fly, you know, around, and I'm sure that that, that did have an effective... Well, it did, Frank, because these prisoners an effect a on very them. vile language. Mm. And do you think it's up and all that? Tell mm. some of the things that happened in the jails, which you are wow. familiar with. You know. you know, it sounds almost like a precursor to the D.A.R.E. program. You're familiar with the D.A.R.E. program yeah, I, in the I public think, schools I think this was about drugs and anti-drug yeah, program? Somewhat similar, mm. yes. And they, they, they were, as I said, fingerprinted. They had handcuffs for mm. them. Wow. They rushed it out to it. What else did you do in that department as far as well, we had crime a prevention? Well, we had a for youth. We had uh, bicycle safety even at a time when 
bicycles had to be licensed. Right. We had problems with the safety of the Thailand and many other places. One of the things I do that did, which it's called, it was called crime prevention and youth activity. But there was a terrible accident that took place in Porchester when these sport cars with the youth who was 16 driving at high velocity, maybe 100 miles an hour, wow. had a tr an accident and both youth perished. Ooh. So I, I thought, I feel you have to make an impression by giving them the tangible evidence of what can happen. Therefore, I went to this garage where this car was absolutely demolished. And then I said to the driver, we were to the owner of the garage, would you want to do something? to help youth the community. He says, yeah, what can I do? I said, could you put that car in the flatbed and bring it down to Mount Vernon High School? And of course, I have pictures there of the car, the vehicle. And the principal was very cooperative. Well, when was this, Steve? No, How I, about? I had the date. I don't know. How about? Day, so I'd say 10 years 80 ago? 80-something. 80 80-something. 20 years ago? I'll, I can yeah. give you the French. You know, uh, the reason I'm asking is because I think I remember that. I think I Man, remember the, the yeah the that. buzz about that. My, riding a bicycle safely in the community, hand signals, just yeah. about a thousand things, Frank. Hmm. We did, and then focused mainly on youth, on or youth. on youth, on youth, and crime prevention where the adults were concerned. Right. For instance, we showed them the proper type of locks to use, demonstrated that how to, how to exist in their homes how to walk the streets. Security systems for their homes? Yes, all kinds of hmm. security uh, devices. Now, did it show that crime, as a result of these techniques and and methods, did crime reduce? Did it well, go it, down, it or is it difficult? Down. I yeah. don't know to what extent. Right. Uh, we also, uh, as I said, showed them how to deport themselves to the streets. And this was across the entire county of Westchester? The entire county. Wow. It's all attributable to the, the progressive attitude of Tom Delaney. Wow. I can't uh, extol him enough because if he hadn't had that perspective and wanted to see things done, we, for instance, have programs on the air on Halloween what the children should do, how the parents should accompany them. Right. Many things which are now taken for granted, I believe, right. but they were doing them then. That's great. That's a very rewarding uh, part of your well, career as was, well. It was indeed, because uh, it, it was something that had to be done. Uh, youth, uh, youth, uh, I believe youth, Frank, should have idols. People, some of them they look at look up to early on, because they follow the proper kind of an individual. Right. Adopt the attitude of that person. They, they follow the straight and narrow rather than they... Right. Than if they were... Sometimes some, youth are in, they must be active too. They must be doing some something. They occupy their time. Baseball, football, crafts, music, right. you name it. Right. Poetry, anything. Exactly. It keeps them, their mind away from trying to be to, to be accepted by doing something, well, offbeat, taking drugs, uh, driving right. a car too fast. Right. Such as that. Steve, this has been an unbelievable pleasure meeting with you several times and getting these vignettes, these snippets, these pieces of your life. An amazing, amazing life. And I have been so honored to be able to creep into pieces of your life, little slivers and slices through looking at these photos and talking with you like this. So I just want you to know that I treasure it, and I always will. Well, I'm trying to be very grateful to you for becoming so profoundly involved in what I have endeavored to do in the past. You sort of take things for granted sometimes, they do accumulate. I think one of the most gratifying experiences was meeting the youth, coaching thousands of youth over the years, and seeing them achieve uh, to uh, gain confidence and to, and to follow their desires in life, whatever profession they might embark on. Right. And to see them succeed, that's important. You know, people have a, 
good streak in them. And when you bring out, when you excite them like you have and inspire them and show them good role models, it gets them to exhibit that good streak rather than the bad streak. Well, the, the kids have to believe that you really know what the subject is. You can't fool the kids, Frank. Pick right. It, pick it up. But they have to feel a lot of the youth that I've encountered have no particular home life. Many of them don't, don't know where their parents are. They're raised by relatives. And it's a pretty sad situation living in that fashion. And so, therefore, they have to feel someone cares about them. Someone is concerned. And sometimes coaches become a second parent, a surrogate parent, if you will. Right. Very good. Well, uh, when I look back on my childhood, I wish I had you as one of my coaches. But uh, I can't tell you this. I have been favorably influenced by uh, many people in my life, and I'm sure you have well, sure, influenced Frank. and inspired many, many hundreds of people. Well, Frank, a lot of it has to do, too, with discipline. My parents were people with disciplinarians. All the schools I went to was take for granted that you would do the right thing, St. Mary's with the Sisters of Charity, and later in Xavier with the uh, Jesuit priests, great teachers. Uh, there, there were certain rules that were not, could not be abridged, that could not be deviated from in any way. That was it. You either accepted the rules or you, did, you were out. Today, the kids are cajoled, I think. <laughs> never, never in my fondest dreams could envision going to school to a high school with a Mercedes Benz. <laughs> you walk to school. Right, right. Uh, that's a reasonable distance. Then. Right. So discipline, hard work. Sacrifice. Sacrifice makes people stronger and... Yeah. And following good role models. Yeah, Frank, I never admire anyone. People I admire the most as they make it the hard way. Right. Not people that have everything handed to them. Not the, right. not the guy that goes to Harvard because his father's on the board. That's he right. donated 500000 That's not real. But the kid that gets the scholarships and go there. That's right. And struggles and knows what it means to be poor. Well, what, what is that? The professional fire that comes from Longbury Street. Whereas the youth used to chop a little wood around the fire on the sidewalk. His father was in the fish market. And one of his, his mother was in a sweatshop. Right. These people appreciate what it is to make it. Right. And I saw that happen with my grandfather, my father, who came to this country. And you passed it along to all these other kids. And well, I try to give them the right perspective. That's the main thing. You have to be Very sure. Good. You can't cajole kids. You can't. Love them, you can't bribe them. Too many parents think that if a kid gets uh, gets a new car or something like that, it's going to make them a better kid. It's not. Right. He's not going to be realistic about life. I'll tell you one little story of a youth that was in my class at the YMCA. A very well educated youth, a very good looking boy. I won't go into any names because I don't think that's necessary. But the youth came there to take boxing lessons. He was a 12-year-old, as timid as he could possibly be. He did de develop the exercise. He did the exercise well, such as skip roping, bag punching, and those things. He did those all well, but he would not get into the ring and bars. Absolutely not. His father was a serious lawyer. And uh, Why not? He was afraid? He was intimidated, but he was leaning. I lean see. on me, you heard that? Right. But his father would get dressed in the gym outfit, kiss the boy, and then stand there and watch him like a Swiss guard. <laughs> so the kid would not get in the ring. And I, his father said to me, may I speak to your office coach? Went to the office, he said, do you think if I buy him white trunks with a black stripe and white shoes like Muhammad Ali wears, that that would <laughs> get him in the ring? I said, I'm really surprised. His name was Lenny. I'm surprised, Lenny. Marble schools do not schools make. No, well, silk trunks get this kid in the ring. Right. I said, I have an idea, Lenny. Does your wife ever go to Bergdorf Goodman's, which is my favorite place in White Plains? Right. He said, well, sometimes she does. 
I said, why don't you take it next week? <laughs> Leave the kid with us. Uh, that's the kid funny. had no alternative. But the punch miss got him into it gradually, began to box. And the end of the story is that that kid had 32 amateur fights. He won 30, 30 of them. Wow. And he was a magnificent boxer, handsome, smart. Because he was smart, he didn't get hit too much. He was very clever. And I can show you pictures of him winning in a battle against the Canadian team at Pelham High School. And his father was there surrounded by all these attorneys. And he wanted to send my son and I to, to Europe for the job we had done with the kid. Gee, that's and amazing. That what a that, wonderful that story. That purpose for doing it. it was right. Or something like exactly. That. And the rewarding thing is that it's greater reward in this world to realize that you'll be able to do something. I have lots of normal students, right. adults as well at the college right now. But the challenge is not to do something for a, a person that can absorb the instruction and perform. That's not the challenge. The challenge is to take a kid from Pleasantville College, Cottage or a kid that's arrested on a gun charge. We don't have many of them, but to find that you can take them, you can do something with it. That's the success of coaching. Excellent, Steve. Thanks again. You're welcome. Okay, Steve, we just came up to your office here, and we're looking at, these are awards that you just got in the last few days. Yeah, Frank, the other ones are kind of all hat, some of them are up about a year old. Right. <laughs> so, so this is just in the last few days. Now, what uh, are we looking at here? Well, this Frank, is... I'm honored and, and humbled to receive these awards. I did, this this is from who? Oh, this yes. is uh, the Boxerama. Well, you may recognize the name. He's the governor of the state of New York. Oh, I see that, so. Isn't that something? Well, I understand. Well, for a certificate of appreciation presented to Steve Acunto on the occasion of Boxerama 24. 25. 25th anniversary of the Boxerama. The organization itself is 36 years old. Oh, that that's great. Like and you got this yesterday? Yes. Oh, that's super. It was yesterday Sunday? Yeah. Oh, I didn't get anything since then. <laughs> <laughs> now, this is another one. Now, this award is dated yesterday, December 3rd, 2006. And this is uh, presented to you, Stephen Biaconto, Deputy Commissioner Emeritus, in recognition of your hard work, dedication, and overall excellence in the sport of professional boxing, New York State Athletic Commission. That's great. Oh, Lifetime right. Achievement and Meritorious Service Award. Right, Hold us up. This yeah, it matches your sweater. <laughs> Should I button my sweater? <laughs> no, leave it just like that. This is good. Not <laughs> oh man, look at all these awards. Now what else did you get? I saw another one over That's here. Another one. Oh, this is from the this is just coincidence that it came in now? This is Italian Tribune. Now that came in yesterday also. Oh, yesterday also. Okay. You only get it in one, a couple of awards once a year. <laughs> <laughs> Certificate of Appreciation. Look at that. Italian Tribune. Italian Tribune. And this is... Well, I'm particularly proud of that. Whoa, man. This is like 30 pounds. I've Westchester County for the last 25 years. Westchester Community Colleges. Something I like to do probably more right. than else in boxing, coaching, teaching. Wow, this is I've been doing so many years, so I guess it's, I'd miss it terribly if I wasn't doing it. Presented to Steve Acunto, Westchester Community College. 28 years of dedicated service to the students of Westchester Community College. Credit classes, non-credit club athletics. We teach both. Like 2006. That. Credit course is the only one in the nation of its National Junior College Athletic Association. Credit that's, course is the only one of its type in the nation. That's amazing. Yeah. Great. Where are you going to put these? What well, wall? I'm running out of a place to repeat them. What wall? I think you should all... give, don't you think I give them back? <laughs> <laughs> no, don't give them back. No, 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 don't give them back. I should return them. <laughs> Uh, that's great. That's a, Wonderful. That's another little, All right. Little, thanks for sharing this oh, with me. my pleasure, Frank. Thanks me. That's my, my good luck thing. That's the, <laughs> that's the uh, leprechaun. Leprechaun. That, and then look at that. You got a green uh, sweater on, too. Well, let me tell you. Want to hear something about a leprechaun? Yeah, let me oh, hear about a little. Yes. Well, as you know, I'm a commissioner of the state. 
And we had a show at the county center, and Jerry Cooney was boxing that night. He had a good luck live replicon. An older person, but he was, he was live. And uh, he was in the dressing room. And of course, the law of the commissions, nobody can enter a ring unless they're licensed by the commission. The leprechaun was Jerry Cooney's good luck charm. So I apprised the leprechaun that he couldn't go into the ring. He could stand <laughs> outside the ring near the corner as a good, good luck uh, symbol. Uh, so I, had, I said to him, I said, leprechaun, you're not allowed the ring. He says, don't worry about me. I wouldn't bother nobody. He couldn't. He was so <laughs> drunk. <laughs> oh, he was a nice little leprechaun. I, that's really funny. I think he probably came from the old side. So that, that's so funny. I have this. So, so you have this little leprechaun. Never. <laughs> oh, that is funny. Let me put it over here and take a picture of it. That is funny. <laughs> Well, uh, Megalos, new president. Oh. That's still the gym all around here. This is the award that you the award you gave out at the box around yeah. yesterday. Wow, that's great. And these are the two oh, for the fellas that didn't come. Uh, Uncle Lennox Lewis here. I love this thing here. i put this back here. That's Stillman's way is to look. That's a player's way to train. Yeah. That's where we sat in ways to be called. Right. These are the type of, just a bunch of managers of meeting. You notice my how they dressed? Yes. There's no, nothing, nothing uh, casual. Nothing sloppy. Ties. Right. And they yeah, were managers. Exactly. Some of them. That's the ring of Summons, the way the rings look. There were two rings on the floor. As you can see. Yeah. That's Summons, the end. Some of the great trainers of this entrance to it right there. These are some of the great trainers of the year. An actual shot of boxing when we were out. Mm. That's Stillman's. That's a, that was the most famous gym in the world, I'd say. 500 fighters. I think this okay, is, this is at the first Founders Award held at the Columbus Club in New York City. Okay, and this this is uh, Bobby Chez on, on the right here. Yes, Bobby and Chez his, and his son Steve in the middle, and yeah, there's better pictures inside now. Chez and myself over there. And that's Arthur McCanty. Yeah, and we were the showing the stamp, which and that's Lou. That's Lou. Lou Marciano. Yeah. And you're showing his stamp. Showing the stamp shortly after Bobby was unveiled. Chez. Okay. Uh, Pictures. She is right. inside, left to right. Right. Louise Montclair, myself, my wife Mercedes. Okay. Right. The second picture below is is a Lou Marciano, Donna, and Arthur McCanty. Okay. World famous referee. And down below is Ches and Donna. Ches and Donna. Bobby Ches and Donna. And his. Chez and I greeting each other. Okay. And there's Chez again with uh, Rocky's stamp in the center and myself. The other picture has no significance. The other picture is not really okay. needed. And that was it. Great. Okay. You got everything. I with the kitchen sink. Okay. Great, really. okay. Yeah. This is the late Willie Pepper. Yeah. His wife is coming down. And she's going to give me his robe, which was hanging. Oh, outside. really? I wrote a story about Pepper. I should send you. I yeah. wrote a story about it. going up in the car. And I felt so upset. Where in Martinelli? No, no. Oh, no, in. No, no. It'll be in every place. Oh, okay. Boxing Illustrated, all that. I know oh. It was one of the greatest friends I ever had. Hmm. Came down five times from Hartford to do this uh, video. Five times he came. Is that right? He was, he was funny in a dry sense of humor. He got this Yeah. Tribute to your wife, Mercedes. Well, I'm, yeah. I'm sometimes stressed. I come and I sit down. She used to be very calm. she says, say, Stephen, don't get upset. We'll work it out. What a wonderful person. Hmm. I can't even bother anybody anymore, Frank. You know? I think about how good she was, you know? With. 
Pep's offensive wizardry made him almost unhittable. He used he let me get my glasses on. It's all bad with stuff I write in one hand. His style combined speed, a super left jab which he doubled and tripled with. And then followed up with video combination punches. Roy was a sharp but not a devastating hitter. Therefore, most of his fights went the distance. Mm. Uh, he once went a single round without throwing a single punch, and he won the round. Well, he died this past week at age 84. And a consensus taken by Boxing Illustrated, i got to get the date here, of the ten cleverest fighters of all time, Willie was ranked number uno. In view of today's pretenders, who are not contenders, and with a few fights, compiled against questionable opponents, they are seeking title shots. Willie holds the record for the greatest number of wins in boxing history. He won 230 professional fights, 65 amateur fights, and after his this icon resumed boxing, after a plane crash, he went on to fight 11 more bouts. He was twice featherweight champion of the world. His, his, <coughs> he possessed that rare combination of quality of combining skill, brains, and guts. We salute him as a long-time loyal friend. He was the first boxing recipient and the first boxerama luncheon ever held at Lake Isle in 1981. He attended every subsequent luncheon until he became too old. He was at every attendant in Rome. For Prosperity, Willie and I put together an instructional video, which is a valuable teaching tool, and where I have coached uh, that teaching tool at uh, WCC, where I've coached for 25 years. The book, Champions Boxing Guide, also features Willie Pepp as one of the instructors, along with Rocky Marciano, Muhammad Ali, and this new generation, Roy Jones. Willie had quite a personality, and when he asked how he was getting along, he, Willie said, my wife works, my television works, and since he had three wives, he said they were good housekeepers. They all kept the houses. <laughs> <laughs> Seeing Willie lying peacefully in his casket in his tuxedo and red silk bow tie reminded us, reminded us that he was once quite a dapper fellow. He liked to dance. Mm. He was small and easy to. His hands were clasped in a final resignation that the fight was over. On the side of she had the, on the, she, uh, the white and red robe hanging, uh, hanging on the, uh, hanging outside of his casket reminded of his conquest at Madison Square Garden, Yankee Stadium and all the other places. They played, uh, featherweight. Yeah. He made two million dollars of featherweight in which the world of piss poured in. Perhaps the millions of cheers and applause, if the, if the millions of cheers and applause could be collated at one time, it would sound like a mighty thunder reverberating in the sky. Wow. Uh, let's, put on, let's put our hands together one more time for a king who will live on forever, for a ring king who will live on in the memory of the fans forever. Wow. So, I love Willie Pepper. Wonderful. Well, I get turned on. You know? Wonderful story. Yeah, yeah, I write well when I'm turned on. I yeah. I just write stuff, you know. Right. You know? And that was very well written. You like it, Frank? Excellent. Excellent. This is George in a casual. George. Right. George. All right, pal. Great. I'm very sorry to hear about the loss of your very good friend. Well, he was just unique, that's all. Yeah. Uh, He's just a great friend. I recall once, and this is off the Buddy. I go to his 75th birthday in Stanford, Connecticut. Uh, he's getting a big birthday party. I'm on the dance along with everybody else. And I thought it'd be nice to thank him for coming down from Hartford four times to make that film. Wow. And he had an old car. He was down the wow. uh, So I said, I'd like to take this opportunity to thank Willie Pep for his generous donation of time we're putting together. Documentary videos and integral part of it and all that stuff. He got me, you know, he said, All these years, I said, I'm doing it for Steve Conto, he's doing it for me, and all of a sudden, we do a dancing for each other. <laughs>
That's a, a lady got up and she started to extol him. Mr. Right. Pep, I saw you fighting and you were great. She went on and on for about two minutes. Pep just said, oh, thank you for the comment. I'm flattered by it. I'm humbled to hear these wonderful remarks. He says, man, I can't disagree with you. <laughs> I said, funny. you're really a horse's ass. He said, thanks, man. That's what funny. I do. I said, she should have said, thank you very much. I appreciate right, it. Right, right. It was not true. He said, well, I... <laughs> he said, That's funny. I can't disagree with you. <laughs> I could have slid under the table. The guy's about as well. Come on. <laughs> That's funny. And then he came down to the film at the college, you see. One of the times he came, so I took him to the grotto on Central Library, was right down the school, the restaurant. You know. Right. So he, he, he said, the girl said, the, the guy in charge of the place was an ex boxer. When he saw Pepe with all his mind, he goes, if you're an amateur and fight like that, you go out of your mind and see a character like that. Right, right. So I see George Washington. Right. <laughs> so Pep sits down. The next time is Vinnie Burling, a police officer, who was assistant coach in the amateur market. So he Pep ordered a steak. He, he ordered, I think he said it was well done. So she brings the steak and she's, he says, girl, he take that back, it just got shot. <laughs> <laughs> uh, he, 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 he don't care. Right. Now, now, he's, now he's eating. I mean, his, 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 uh, Burling goes on with the left arm is here, Pep's right arm, he's eating. So Bully, every time he put his left arm up, he bumped into Pep's right arm. See? So after a while, then he was very not modest, nice guy. He said, oh, excuse me, Bully. We well, said, what did you do that two hours ago? I got a broken arm. <laughs> <laughs> he, he, he's that way, dry sense of humor. Right, right. They had a heart of gold. Very good. End of story. End of one of that. So if I can tell you that story, the whole true story. What does that have to Okay, Steve. Hi, pal. Uh, can I? I'll take it. Really forbidden parking at all times. Lee Park said, he has his back to me, and the police officer has his back, back to me, big guy. And it was in my department. So I said, say nothing to him. So I walked across the street where I had from the park place. I said, you see a small runt around here? <laughs> it's only a flat flyway. Cut away. He said, well, he says, it's you, you son of a bitch. He says, you finally got here. I said, you're late. I'm not late. I've been waiting for you in the parking lot. He said, this guy will help me park here. I see that sign, absolutely forbidden. What does that mean? You park? Can you read? <laughs> and he had this diatribe going on. That's funny. He said, at least find me a cup of coffee. You ain't 500 miles. And you didn't come 500 miles. You can't park. <laughs>